In my previous video, I discussed parts one and two of a free series focused on the family sent me about teaching kids apologetics. Those ones were about the importance of apologetics and how to train your kids to interact with the world. And while each video stands on its own and can be watched in either order, in other words, please don't leave and make the algorithm punish me, I'd suggest checking it out at some point. Today we're going to finish off starting with video three, which is about actual apologetics you can teach your kids. <laughs> Natasha, let's start with uh, teaching our kids the evidence for God's existence. Let's get into some practical application. Now, we kind of talked about the theory of it. Um, you say many Christians rely on the wrong kind of evidence. Um, explain what you mean. Well, I wouldn't say necessarily it's the wrong kind of evidence, but I think that if you ask a lot of Christians, you know, how do you know Christianity is true? 95% of the time a Christian will give you their testimony. And so they'll, get, they'll tell you about their experience. And that's extremely important. So it's not that it's wrong to share your testimony, but we have to understand we cannot export our own experience to anyone else. This is interesting in light of the fact that even apologist extraordinaire William Lane Craig cites the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, something that's purely internal and can only be conveyed through personal testimony, as the ultimate clincher in the question of God's existence. Of course, he kind of treats this idea as an afterthought despite the lip service he pays to it, which shows he understands the tension between two conflicting ideas. One, that a direct relationship with God is what's really supposed to be at the heart of Christianity, and two, that there's a practical limit to what this idea gets you in conversation with anybody other than yourself. Keep these two ideas, and the conflict between them, in mind as she explains the limits of personal testimony. So if it's you're, evidence of it's yes, it's evidence of. So if your kids come to you and they ask, how do you know Christianity is true? And you tell them about something that happened to you that they haven't experienced yet. They're getting all of these kinds of intellectual challenges from the world. Then they're kind of b between a rock and a hard place there. And it, where do you go? And so it's important mm. that we learn about the objective evidence for God's existence as well, that we can point to outside of ourselves, that we can all sit around this table and point to in the middle and say, hey, I've experienced this. You've experienced that. Let's look at the evidence in the middle that we can all point to. So while it's good that she acknowledges the limits of testimonials, there's something tricky in her proposed switch to evidence-based discussion, especially as she suggests her audience should make use of it. If you tell someone, this is my testimony and leave it at that, then sure, you can't prove your religion right to anybody else. But at least you're being open about how little you know, about how personal and really kind of arbitrary your individual spiritual journey is. And I don't say that as any kind of passive-aggressive jab. I'm just pointing to a pragmatic fact, which is that even if any spiritual reality exists, whatever shape it takes is shrouded in mystery with basically no confirmable evidence for any of it. Sure, some people will take exception to me saying that, but I think most will share my sense that questions of spirituality are huge, and anybody who wants to make conclusions about them should be extremely tentative and humble in doing so. This is true for even the most learned theologian, guru, or scholar. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Pope is pretty smart when it comes to Catholicism, but do you think he could sit across from the Dalai Lama or the boss of some other religion and point to something that would make them think, oh crap, I picked the wrong one? Of course not. Otherwise, people around the world would have come to more or less the same religious conclusions the way we tend to arrive at a unified body of scientific conclusions. So imagine the audacity of the average layperson thinking they personally are qualified to sit around a table and set others straight about religion. It's absurd. So Natasha's not doing anybody a favor when she suggests parents come to their children with this level of false confidence and train them to take that same confidence out into the world. It's going to lead to a lot of conversational and even relational frustration they'll blame on the person they're talking to for not being convinced when the real blame falls on public figures who convince you that you can argue to clear, definitive answers using superficial apologetic arguments. And so that's what's very important today because so many kids are being compelled by the intellectual challenges and that's what all the research is showing. So there's only so much your personal experience can do toward that. This is reasonable, but I find it interesting in light of Christian theology and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit I'd said Craig refers to. I mean, if you're ultimately supposed to respond to this witness and God offers it freely to everybody, why is there any need for argumentation? It's hard to see what the role of apologetics or any external facts presented by another person should play in a universe in which each person is responsible for their own salvation based on how they respond to God's call. I mean, that is how Christianity is supposed to work, right? So if your kid gets turned by the world and stops responding to God, it seems one of two things happened. Either God communicated imperfectly, or the kid simply chose to reject him. Either way, I can't see how the missing link in this chain was you as a parent not being good enough at teaching apologetics. 
To me, this makes all this parental neurosis about making sure you prepared your kid for the world's intellectual challenges seem weirdly incompatible with any coherent view of the Christian God. From there they discuss why it's important to teach kids both what scripture says and how we can know it's true, as summed up by this remark. So we have to teach our kids accurately and thoroughly what's in the Bible. We also have to teach them about the Bible and right. why we can trust it. That's all pretty unremarkable. But where it gets interesting is where he brings up the divine hiddenness argument. I'm going to play this out with a few quick interjections. As we watch it unfold, keep in mind their previous foray into apologetics amounted to why does God allow evil so we can choose to follow? Maybe we can start to see if there's a pattern in how they set up and tackle arguments against God. Right, that is excellent. And I think this next question kind of lends itself to that. And I'm thinking of this in the context of teenagers. And this will be the question we ask tonight around the dinner table with our boys. But it is this. One common argument against God is that he, he doesn't make his existence undeniable. I like the way that's stated. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, if he's perfectly loving, why is he still such a mystery? Why doesn't he just declare it so there's no question? Mm -hmm. Okay, we all know God is there. Yeah. Why that distinction that you must trust him by faith? That's a fairly good summation of the problem, but I'd personally add why does the world look so much like a place that could be mistaken for a godless one? And why do most of his proposed actions, except for those that occur in the distant past, look so similar to random chance or natural occurrences? This is more important than the minutia of phrasing, because the problem of divine hiddenness needs to tackle more than the question of why God isn't constantly showing himself in spectacular fashion. It needs to account for what appears to be a concerted effort not to show himself. Right. That, and there, there are a lot of pieces that kind of go yeah. into answering that, question. obviously. It's a huge That's question. That's an adult question, that, frankly. That is an adult question. It absolutely is. And in fact, I've been asked a lot of times, what makes me doubt or what challenges me? And the hiddenness of God, I think, is, is a primary issue for a lot of people. Um, so it's a good one. I think that the first part of that answer comes from having our kids understand the evidence for God's existence first. A lot of times when people ask that question, they're asking it assuming that there is no evidence, mm -hmm. that we just have to blindly believe. Lines of armchair reasoning that seem to point to God in some obscure, highly arguable way might rise above the level of blind faith, but they're not the same as God regularly manifesting as part of reality in a way that addresses the divine hiddenness argument. We shouldn't let Natasha try to conflate the two, and that's even generously granting that apologetics are compelling to begin with. Even if they were, the only reason you need apologetics to teach you how to rationally infer his existence is because he's hidden in a very meaningful way that creates an obstacle to believe. My kids don't need anybody to come to my house and teach them how to infer that I exist because I'm a clearly present father. Maybe that's something Christianity could use. And that is that is just so detrimental to kids' faith today if they believe that faith is a blind leap in the dark, that there's actually no evidence. We just have to close our eyes and say, I hope, I hope it's true. And so we don't want kids to have that blind faith. So if they have the evidence for God's existence to start with, then we can begin to answer that question. Why isn't there more evidence? Right. You're always going to have to deal with two things when talking to an apologist. The argument that's actually in front of you at the moment and all the other apologetics that are somewhere else out there. Now the one in front of you is the actual topic of conversation, right? But even if you break it down to the point of showing it adds up to nothing, the apologist can always just make some sweeping gesture to all the other arguments out there and say, yeah, but there are still these. That's what Natasha is doing here. Before addressing divine hiddenness, she stops to assure everybody, no matter how badly this is about to go, remember that you and your kids still have a bunch of other evidence. But rather than letting her pull this off, Let's focus exclusively on her answer to divine hiddenness and let it stand or fall on its own merit. Then we can evaluate each of the other pieces of evidence one at a time as she pivots to them instead of letting her take some vague solace on their mere existence. And so when we get to that question, and so many atheists say, you know, if God just wrote in the sky, you know, here I am, we're showed up in my living room, you know, what would that be? Even that is a bit iffy. Most things we believe in, at least that immediately impact how we live our lives, are demonstrated to us through daily exposure and slowly integrate themselves into our understanding of the world. So considering the fact that God by all appearances spends most of his time going out of his way to make it look like he doesn't exist, a sudden magic trick or manifestation wouldn't really mean much and, unless you were just waiting to import existing theological assumptions into the conversation, would introduce more questions than answers. You can watch my Dumb Things People Say to Atheists video titled What Would It Take to Make You Believe for a lot more on this. And a good way to explain this to kids, I think, is that if you imagine a detective, kids love detectives, right? Yeah, sure. My kids were born in the 1930s. How about yours? 
You see a detective. He goes in. He evaluates the evidence. He looks at all the pieces that are there and comes to the best explanation for that. We would laugh if a bumbling detective came out of the room and said, well, I don't like what's there, so I want these five things instead to tell me about who did this. You know, I wish that he had left a note with his name and his phone number. I wish, I wish, I wish, right? It doesn't necessarily make logical sense to come up with a wish list of the evidence that we want to have. We have to look at what we do have. This is a spectacularly bad analogy. I mean, sure, it would be silly for a detective to demand easier clues than the ones available at a crime scene. But do you know why this is? Because the criminal wouldn't leave his name and number behind since he committed a crime and doesn't want his existence or identity discovered. Which is, you know, why we need detectives. So this doesn't work as an analogy for the problem of divine hiddenness because the very nature of the problem is the question of why an all-powerful, omnibenevolent God would make a similar attempt to hide his existence. It's not about us making a wish list of evidence we want to have, as Natasha said. It's about why God would want to hide from us the way a criminal hides from a detective. The fact that Natasha, either through disingenuousness or utter ineptitude, could even come up with such a flagrantly inadequate, even self-sabotaging analogy while the focus on the family host just nod and go along as if she said anything worthwhile tells me everything I need to know about this whole thing. It's not about engaging in honest exploration and trying to uncover real answers, nor about training your kids to do the same. It's about slapping a laughable band-aid over obvious problems with what you already believe so your kids will keep believing it, and feeling like you're teaching them instead of just telling them to blindly believe you. But I'm sorry. Parents who give their kids apologetics like this are still expecting blind belief. They're just adding extra steps to make it feel more sophisticated than that. It's utterly embarrassing horse and every person sitting at that table should know better than this. Now she's going to rattle off some of that other evidence. Let's see how great it ends up being. And so when we point our kids to that evidence, where did the universe come from? That's not evidence for God. Just a huge question that we would do well to treat as a mystery instead of rushing to throw our existing theological answers at. Where did life come from? Looking at the complexity of life and of how our universe is structured just right to support life. Not only is this a mystery at best, not only is it largely accounted for by life adapting to the environment it's in, not only does 99.99999% of the universe and most of the surface of the earth kill humans, but saying God fine-tuned the universe for life is just incoherent. It's not like humans existed before God created anything, requiring him to fine-tune the universe for their survival. He actually had to go out of his way to design us to die without an atmosphere before fine-tuning the earth to have one. He had to go out of his way to design us to die unless we constantly fueled our bodies with the remains of other life before fine-tuning the earth to provide this fuel. And I could go on and on and on. For every solution God solved by fine-tuning the universe, he had to first create the problem that required fine-tuning. It simply makes no sense, and I still remain unimpressed by Natasha's ability to spit square one apologetics into a microphone and hope that Christians who have rarely pondered apologetics and never had a serious conversation with an atheist will buy her book. And where did our moral understanding come from? From a complex set of instincts that are difficult to fully understand and aren't at all better understood by imagining the existence of another being. All these things I talk about in the book that are these pieces of evidence, when we look at that, then we can say, okay, this is the evidence. What's the best explanation for it? Yeah, so after all this buildup, she just revealed herself to be a total apologetics noob repeating basic apologetics noobery. <laughs> and if God were to show up in everyone's living room, kind of the bottom line answer to that original question, she's going to say free will. We all know it, right? He would be taking away our free will to choose to love him freely. No, 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 no. This does not even pass as a bad answer. Knowing that something exists has nothing to do with the choice of whether to love it. And I don't mean that it has little to do with it or that the connection is tenuous. There's literally no relationship between these two ideas. I mean, does every human who shows themselves to you take away your free will to choose whether to love them? No. This is just bald-faced, incoherent, lazy excuse-making. If you want to be this flagrantly stupid in this compartmentalized corner of your mind, I guess that's your choice. But it f***ing pisses me the hell off when broadcasts like this encourage parents to present this to developing children as an example of rational thinking. 
And so philosophers have grappled with this for hundreds, thousands of years probably. And that's something that ultimately we can't say exactly why. We can't, we don't have the mind of God, but we can come to these intellectually satisfying answers of saying, I don't have every possible answer, but I can say that God wants us to freely love him. In other words, I don't have every answer, but also here's an assertion about something I don't really know. For the rest of this video, they talk about how you can use an ant farm to illustrate the fine-tuned universe. What the analogy adds up to is, the ants need some special blue gel for food, so people give them to ants just like God gives us a planet with water and food and stuff. It's pointless because people buy ants that already have this need, whereas God decided to create us with a need before supplying it, but I've already covered that. So let's go on to video 4, which is called, The Most Critical Question. This might be the most critical question of all, and of course, we're going to encourage you to get Natasha's book, because I think every parent, I don't care how old your yeah. kids are, both for yourself as well as for your children, need to answer these 30 questions and be proficient at thinking them through. What kind of proficiency is required to repeat the kinds of basic pet answers they've been talking about? How is thinking anything through part of the process? It's just rote memorization of extremely shallow excuses. And not only is this pretense that it's about teaching actual critical thinking skills absurd, but it can do a lot to warp how a Christian parent trains and relates to their child. But here's the one. How can we help our children understand how to have a relationship with a God they can't see, and in most cases can't really audibly hear? It's that intuitive Holy Spirit voice that we hear in our hearts and our souls. H how do we do that? How do we help them have that relationship? I think that's a great question to ask because a lot of times parents come at it from assuming that because we've become used to having a relationship with a God that we don't physically see and hear that our kids will know how to do that. But it's a really foreign thing if, if you think about it. When, when you put yourself in your kids' shoes, your young kids' shoes, and you're telling them that God exists and God loves them and, hey, you need to love him too and here start having this relationship, it's very hard to explain that. This is a good point, and I'm glad Natasha at least acknowledges the difficulty of this issue. So what's her solution? And so I think, number one, it's important for us to just acknowledge to our kids, hey, this is different. This is something different than relating to your friends at school. You can't see, you can't, you can't see God, you can't hear him. But just like with a friend at school, if you're going to get to know someone, and if you want to love that person, you have to get to know them. And we hear from God through his word. And so that's where first the Bible study comes from, and, and helping our kids understand the importance of studying the Bible together. And we respond to God by our prayer and through our serving. And so those are, and I could kind of elaborate on all those things, but that's kind of the big picture of how I approach this with my kids is to think of it. If you're having that relationship with someone you know at school, it's kind of the same thing, that you're hearing from them and you're responding to them. In, in the context of God, we hear from God in His Word and through the Holy Spirit, and then we return by prayer and by serving others. Now this is just an irresponsibly inadequate answer to a horrible problem. Her suggestions are to, one, acknowledge that having a relationship with God is different, two, get to know God by reading the Bible, three, pray, and four, serve other people. If you do this, apparently, you're going to start to hear from God through his word and the Holy Spirit. But how does reading the Bible feel like a relationship with anybody? What does hearing him through the Holy Spirit even mean? I mean, how you do that is part of the core issue anyway, right? This is something that really gets under my skin, because telling kids to have a relationship with someone they can't see and hear is an extraordinarily complex, abstract exercise that's purely internal and offers the child no feedback on whether they're doing it right. I can think of no better way to explain it than in this clip from an older video titled, How a Relationship with God Torments Children. By telling them to establish a relationship with God, they're expecting them to conjure an idea of the being they need to interact with in their own heads. Of course, this is guided by instruction from the Bible and from adults in their lives, but still, the task is on them to distill these stories and abstractions into the idea of a personality, one they must generate and hold in their minds while convincing themselves to feel that it's a real thing that's actually with them. Then they need to start having a relationship with it. But how does a person do this? Well, usually you talk to that person. Great. But how do you talk to a being you're picturing in your head who, while ostensibly everywhere, still has a presence that comes and goes and gets stronger and weaker and must be conjured? And how do you really feel that you're properly directing your conversation to this being? Modern Christians often just speak into the air, or maybe whisper or think their thoughts to God, because, you know, he can read your mind and all that. So I guess that teaching can more or less assure you that he'll technically hear the words you're uttering. But still, 
This idea runs against all your intuition of how you interact with someone else. And training yourself to talk while you're just sitting by yourself without feeling like it's just weird, and to be legitimately convinced that this is a meaningful exercise actually directed towards someone, is a big thing to ask of a kid. And that's before we even approach the hard stuff. How do you hear God talking back? How do you get any feeling of reassurance that he's there with you, hears you, and that there is any form of back and forth communication happening? And how can you feel this feedback so convincingly and so tangibly that it actually becomes an emotional reality for you and that you thus have the vital relationship with God? This is incredibly challenging even for adults. So imagine how cruelly inaccessible it is for children. All the relational cues and assurances you would pick up from another human must somehow be conjured in your mind, which is why prayer and worship are important to Christians. Prayer puts you into a meditative state in which you can relax, say reassuring words, and try to generate some kind of euphoric feeling that you can interpret as another presence within your mind. If you're good at this, and a little lucky, you can hear thoughts inside your own head that you start to think aren't your own, thus getting at least the impression of some actual conversation. And worship, of course, is just a crass, obviously manipulative exercise in using strategically chosen and performed music sets to stir emotions. So think of what's involved in reliably conjuring feelings using these experiences. Then think of the complex internal thought process needed to reshape these emotions into what you feel naturally when you interact with another person, and to trick yourself into feeling like they are feedback from an imaginary character you're maintaining inside your head. Now consider the fact that this highly abstract, poorly defined task is being expected of kids, some of whom might have a difficult time fully grasping whether they've made connection with, have the approval of, and have established a relationship with a visible person. And this is presented as the most high-stakes task a child needs to accomplish, because a relationship with God is the ultimate goal of Christianity. And that sounds nice, right? Christianity has stripped away the rituals, legalism, and works-based tasks of structured religion and just made it about loving God. But it's not nice. It's horrifyingly, traumatizingly cruel. Because not only are kids admired or shamed based on how well they conjure absurdly complex, abstract thought processes, but depending on the teaching and how it's presented, their relationship with God is the basis of their salvation. So no pressure, kids but you'll live in eternal bliss or f***ing burn in hell based on how well you've gone through these mental contortions. And there's really no marker of whether or not you've succeeded, because not only is it vague, it's internal. It's between you and a non-existent being you're imagining inside your own mind. A scary, lonely place where no adult can enter to help you process the doubts, fears, and questions they set into motion for you. Sure, they can reassure you with platitudes and generalizations, but as any kid who grew up in this environment can tell you, that doesn't really put the fears to rest. Think about that. Let it sink in what evangelicals are asking of children. How little they have to go on to tell them whether they're doing it right. What the f***ing stakes are. This is huge, and Natasha's four pieces of advice do nothing to help them cope with the daunting thing they're being asked to do with their own eternal torture on the line. Natasha, we're right near the end, and I, I, I'm thinking of the parent who, uh, maybe they're through the 10, 11, 12-year-old stage, and they are in the teen years now, and there, there's a lot more independence in those years. The teenagers are trying to express themselves and find out who they are and becoming more independent from the parental control that's been rightfully kind of there in the earlier years of development. How does that parent who's been desperate to ensure there's a relationship there with God, because they know this is eternity. What we're talking about here is the most serious business of any human soul. Do you know God or do you not know God? But to that desperate parent who may be thinking, I haven't been able to do this. It hasn't caught. Something's wrong. And they lay up awake in the middle of the night worrying about their 15-year-old who may be listening to things, doing things that's inconsistent with the faith. What suggestion do you have for them in that desperation? How do we not become fearful as we open the program with that great scripture from 2 Timothy? Where do they get the assurance to say, okay, God, do you have this? We all worry about our kids. But while I know this can be hard for a Christian to do, you'll be able to worry less if you stop trying to keep your kids in a box. Stop fretting over unrealistic and, from any plausible understanding of the world, unnecessary Concerns that your kids end up sharing your exact beliefs about the religion you happen to be trying to raise them in. I get that anxiety over whether your child will go to hell is a lot to live with. 
I empathize with that, and I hurt for the fact that you've been subjected to this unnecessary form of anxiety. I see you as a victim of bad ideas, and I know you really think eternity is on the line for your child. But if there's any way for you to start seeing this fear for what it is, to introspect on how it got into your head and whether it deserves to be there, to consider whether you want to pass this fear onto your child the way someone passes it on to you, it will be worth it. It's a monumental task, and it won't happen overnight. But you don't need those restless nights worrying about this, and your child doesn't need to feel the same anxiety about themselves and eventually their children. Please, carefully consider the legacy you want to pass on to future generations. Yeah, I think that first and foremost, praying. We, we have to continue praying and asking God for guidance in that. So we, can, we can't lose our sight of our, relation, our own relationship with God in that. I think that the more that I talk with parents who have teenagers who are in that situation, the more I realize that every parent realizes what they did wrong was panic when their kids first started expressing doubts. Right. It shut down the communication line so that they don't have the relationship that they could have in terms of those questions. So their kids no longer want to talk. and that's, They're fearful to talk to you about it. They're fearful because... They're afraid that their questions are going to upset you. This is true, but you need to acknowledge that it's not just a matter of you panicking. It's not just a matter of you not being okay with questions. It's the expectation that when asking those questions, they'll land on a specific belief that their honest inquiry won't always show them as evidently true and their exposure to the world will often indicate is not true. It's the expectation to hear them rattle off hollow buffoonish apologetics and pretend they're not laughable. When you expect this of them, you're putting a pressure on them to bend their own minds to a pre-desired conclusion. You're expecting them to either lie or subject themselves to extreme cognitive dissonance. You're denying them one of their deepest instincts, which is to explore the world with freedom not only to ask questions, but actually explore a variety of possible answers. On top of that, you're shutting yourself out of a real and very meaningful dialogue that's going on in their heads. So even if they do try to please you, even if they do come up with the right answers, convince themselves of these answers and feed them back to you, you'll just be hearing them recite what you want to hear. The rich web of questions they have, possible answers they're pondering, all that very real, sometimes uncomfortable stuff that swirls around in any developing mind as they grow into adolescence and young adulthood, will be off limits to you because you decided you didn't want to hear it. By telling them your okay with questions, but making it implicitly but abundantly clear they better come up with specific answers, you'll have given them the choice between the adversarial relationship you fear and a compliant relationship that's even more empty, even if you don't know it. And then you'll wonder why the communication line is shut down. These people are missing the point if they think it's a question of how you communicate to your kids that they better land on a specific set of theological beliefs. The problem is that you have that expectation to begin with. And I've always told those parents, go back to your kids and just acknowledge, you know, this is what I, when I responded poorly, you know, obviously, and you can say, as a Christian, I believe this is true and that there are eternal implications for what you believe. So please understand from my perspective that this is important to me, but I want to understand where you're coming from. I want to hear your questions. I want to understand. And the best thing that parents can do in that situation is to continue to ask questions because teens love to talk and give their opinion and their thoughts. And a lot of times what they say in the beginning isn't necessarily what's causing them to lose faith. It might be, oh, I heard that Christianity is just a copycat from pagan religions, and that's why I don't believe it more, anymore. In reality, they might have been really hurt by a Christian at school and decided that they're done with Christianity. Right. But you're not going to know that, and you're not going to know how to have those kinds of conversations unless you've asked a lot of questions up front. Why did you stop believing? What kinds of things have you heard about Christianity? Right. What kind of evidence is there for the worldview that you now go to? So here's the problem. Kids are perceptive. If you're asking them questions, you need to do it sincerely trying to understand where they're coming from. If you're digging with a suspicion that they're just pretending to see issues with Christianity because someone hurt them, they're going to see that come through in your questioning. If your goal in trying to understand them is not to hear them out but to find out what went wrong and fix them, they're going to smell that coming before you've even started talking. They may be young, but they're real people. And as real people, they're far too sophisticated for the kind of thinly veiled patronizing disrespect Natasha thinks is going to improve your relationship with them. I think that's something most kids don't ever think about. Maybe they throw away God, but they haven't thought about what are the implications of an atheistic worldview. If God doesn't exist, what does that actually mean? Cornering your kids to account for an atheistic worldview they shouldn't expect to have fully considered might not even espouse just because they ask questions about your faith isn't the helpful move Natasha is representing it as. 
So there are all kinds of conversations that can spring from that. But for the parent who's lying awake, keep praying. Know that there's a long time ahead. A lot of things happen during those teen years. Keep having the conversations. Ask lots of questions and keep the relationship open. Well, I so appreciate that, Natasha. This is good stuff. This is deep stuff that all of us, even as adults and believers in Christ, need to grapple with so that we have an answer, that we're prepared. And uh, I think (laughs) reading the book is good for everyone. So here we are at the end. I'm not sure I have a lot more to say here by way of closing thoughts that I haven't already covered. The series reveals a lot about how evangelical culture encourages parents to interact with their kids, and a lot of it isn't great. If you're a Christian and your kid is really doubting, then none of the shallow apologetics and thinly veiled expectations this video encourages are going to be of any help to you. They'll likely create unnecessary tension between you and your child, or at best elicit empty compliance that won't be much better for your relationship. If you're a Christian who got this far, I hope something I've said will help you rethink something about your approach to parenting. And if you're a former believer, hopefully this helped you better understand your experiences either as a child or a parent. Whoever you are, whatever you believe, I hope better for you than what's encouraged by Focus on the Family and Natasha Crane. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.